Excellent. How much do the books actually cost? <laughs> they are priceless. So it doesn't matter how much you have to pay for those books. Some of the Dhamma in those books is just so amazing. So it's not to be missed. I must admit, if you haven't seen any of those books yet, I would kind of recommend the first book to get would be the, the middle length sayings. Because they are kind of, some extremely deep, but some are just quite um, average, and there's only 152 of the suttas there. If you get some of those bigger books, like the Anguttara Nikaya Samyutta, there's so many suttas there, and it might take you a while to finish them all. So those of you who really want to get started, I would recommend the middle exams, first of all, the Majjhima Nikaya. The middle way is always the best way. That's why I always see the people sitting in the middle lines here. <laughs> Those are the... I better not say. <laughs> anyway, let's get started with one of the questions first of all. And even though that some of you put the questions in last and I saw that, I still turn them all upside down, so I don't know whose is who. Dear Ajahn, what is your view of a Buddhist on vegetarian versus non-vegetarian? Whatever you can do health-wise, I used to be a vegetarian before I became a monk, a very strict vegetarian. But I was also an uncompassionate vegetarian. I loved animals, but I hated people. And I would just be looked down upon people who did eat meat. These days, because I'm a monk, and I don't really have too much choice over what I eat, it seems to be that whatever is food close to what I liked to eat when I was young tends to do better for me. And I sometimes wonder why it was when the Buddha had a chance to make vegetarianism one of the rules for monks and nuns, but he refused. He wanted to give that more leeway for monks and nuns to get what was good for their health. If you can be a vegetarian, marvelous. If you can be a vegan, marvelous. If you can not eat at all, marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> so you do the best you possibly can. Do you see on vegetarian health better with one's meditation progress. That I actually don't. It's why you're a vegetarian or why you eat meat. That helps with the progress in meditation more than anything else. Because that John Char, he would eat meat. That was just what was available naturally in that part of Thailand. And he had a wonderful meditation. So it doesn't seem to have too much of an effect. Do you see on vegetarian starts better with the path of letting go, either desire or for food? You know, sometimes if you can really let go and just eat what is given to you. Well, this was an example. Maybe it's not a, uh, an appropriate example for me to say, but I remember just when I was at university, you know, please excuse me, I did have girlfriends. Uh, I was looking about to say girlfriends, but you know, one at a time. <laughs> and one of the relationships which I had, I always felt quite guilty for it afterwards, because you know, she'd invited me for lunch, not sorry, for dinner. And so just the two of us, she made this dinner, and she thought it was you know, what I liked. It was some Indian food. It was actually with meat in it and I refused to eat it. I was so strict, I said, no, no, you should have known better. You know, I don't eat meat at that time. And that was really a nasty thing which I did. I always regret that. What I should have done, she made a mistake, and so I should have eaten that food and afterwards told her, no, I don't eat meat. But eating it first out of kindness for her. That really disappointed her. Imagine that was you, how it would feel, you're rejecting somebody's food 
They went to all that trouble trying to get it for you and you refused it. So those are some times when I see that you can go over the top with vegetarianism. The kindness would have been better. Kindness to animals, but also kindness to humans too, who make mistakes. Dear Ajahn, is consciousness and the mind one and the same? Which consciousness do you mean? Because there are six different types of consciousness. So when I sometimes read out the Buddha's suttas, in translation of course, I always mention like things like the five candors, you know, the basically material stuff, not just the body, but material stuff. I do change some of those usual translations. Instead of saying feeling, it's more like experience is number two. Number three is perception. You never found a better translation than that. Number four, you know, the sankhara. Sometimes they, people have all sorts of terms for that, but the main translation of Sankara, the one which the Buddha used most of all, was will. Will, you know, the choice, what you decide to do. And it means more than that, but that's the, the most important part of the word Sankara, the will and things which are made from the will. And that makes the translations way more powerful when you realize the will is not yours. It's out of control. It's not your friend. You've heard me say many times the path of meditation is not about disciplining or controlling your mind. It's about letting go, renouncing, freeing, kindness. Kindness is the opposite of will. And when you translate like that, which is accurate, it does change much of people's understanding about what the Dhamma is, what the purpose is. That's one of the reasons I pause to make that translation. And the last of the five candidates, Vinyana. And it's always translated as the six types of consciousness. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and mind consciousness, knowing. And because many people think that consciousness just means mind consciousness, they miss much of the meaning of those six terms. When is six different types of consciousness, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, and mind consciousness, then you also notice that no two of those consciousnesses can be present at the same time. Because of that, I devised the similes. One of the similes was the fruit salad simile. It's not a great simile, but it's the best I could come up with. Suppose you had a plate, and on that plate there appeared an apple. And then that apple totally vanished and was replaced by a coconut. And then the coconut vanished and replaced by another apple. And then a coconut. Then a banana and another coconut. And another banana and another coconut. In all these different fruits, I always say they represent one of the different consciousnesses. The apple, sight, Apple of the eye. <laughs> Banana, the smell. Especially Westerners, we have big noses, like bananas. <laughs> so, what happens if, once you understand how this consciousness works, you know, we have things like seeing, then we know we saw. You know, seeing again, then we know we saw. We have smell, and we know we smell. Another smell, we know we smell. The knowing, the mind consciousness, follows after each of the five senses. And it also has its own domain of objects. You know, then you know that you knew. 
when you put in the chronology of conscious and experience, then you can understand how Western philosophers like Descartes, his mistake, he said, I know, therefore I am. That was totally illogical. You can only say, I knew, and I know now. But not that I am. If you want to be accurate, he said, I know, therefore I was. You can only have one conscious experience at a time. When one understands things like that, one can actually see it as this process of conscious experience. There's a flow of one consciousness, one type of consciousness, and then another type of consciousness. Yes, it does move quite fast, but when the mind slows down and your mindfulness increases, you can see that flow. And every different type of conscious experience is different from the one which went before. What that does, it takes away the illusion of continuity. It's much more like watching those old types of movies. Old, or even new types of movies, but new types of movies, they move so fast. In the old types of mu movies, you had the, um, what's it called, the, uh, the film running through a projector, a celluloid film, running very fast, giving the illusion of movement. But that celluloid film was just a series of still shots, changing very slowly, but when run through a projector, it appeared that it was continuous movement. And that was a very good simile for the nature of consciousness. We think that we're always aware. But when you start meditating and you get more alert, your mindfulness gets stronger, you see that these are moments of consciousness, not continuous, just like the old movies. Beep, beep, beep. Each one of those beeps is a different types of consciousness. That takes away the illusion that consciousness is continuous. It's momentary. So, consciousness in the mind, what we call the mind is uh, almost like the organ which has that mental consciousness. Right, the eye sees, the ear hears, the mind knows. But we use these words so loosely that sometimes we jumble them all up. When most people say consciousness, they don't mean just this momentary consciousness. They usually mean the mind, the thing which, uh, the organ which operates. The, the knowing faculty inside of you. So is it different? Mind and the consciousness are the same? You may interpret it as the same, even though they are quite different. Does that make sense to you? I hope it doesn't, because if it does, then you won't come on any more retreats. You'll be enlightened. <laughs> I'll be out of a job. <laughs> Not being honest. Dear Ajahn Brahm, lately after a few days of meditation retreat, I start having dreams. What is the significance of this? Dreams are not scary or sad. Is this a normal phenomenon? It is a normal phenomenon. It's probably because your mind is now more sensitive, your mindfulness has increased, and that means that you're more aware of the dreams you have and you can remember them with greater clarity. But you have to be careful of dreams. There was this one man over in Perth where I live and he had a dream and the dreams you remember are the dreams which you usually have just before you wake up. And so he had this very interesting dream about five angels.
He hasn't even heard the punchline yet, <laughs> but he's already laughing at it. He dreamt of five angels, and each angel in the dream had his five pots of gold worth a fortune. And they lined up, and each angel presented this man with a bag of gold, another pot of gold, another pot of gold. So in the end, he had five times five, 25 pots of gold worth a fortune. And as usually happens when you dream of the last angel giving you the last pot of gold, that's when you wake up. <laughs> and he turned on the light in the bedroom. He couldn't see any angels in the bedroom at all. He wasn't concerned about that, but he couldn't see any pots of gold either. And that was disappointing. So anyway, he went down for breakfast and he was quite surprised. That morning, his wife, who had got up early and gone to work, had made him five boiled eggs and five pieces of toast. He said, why didn't she do five? And he looked at the morning newspaper, the 5th of May. May is the fifth month. And he thought, what is with this number five? So he looked in the newspaper in the horse racing section. <laughs> you never know. And he looked in one of the horse racing tracks, the courses over in Perth, is named after a course over in UK, Ascot. A S C O T. Five letters. So he looked in race number five that afternoon and he couldn't believe his eyes. In race number five, horse number five was called Five Angels. Whoa. <laughs> and he thought, you only get these lucky dreams once in your life, if at all. So what did he do? He took the afternoon off work. He never told his wife, but instead he went to his bank at lunchtime to keep the lucky number five. He took $5,000 out of his account. And he went to the racetrack. He went to the fifth bookmaker in line and he put $5,000 to win on horse number five, race number five, five angels. He knew that the lucky number five couldn't be wrong. And the lucky number five wasn't wrong. His horse came in fifth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the trouble with dreams. Sometimes they're telling you something, but sometimes you have to interpret it, and a lot of time you don't get it and you lose. I know I just tell too many stories, but another story, there was this uh, lady from Singapore who married this Englishman who was working in Singapore. And eventually they retired down into Perth. But of course, he was English, she was Singaporean. So every year they had to go to Singapore so she could chat, 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 chat with her, with her sisters and other relations. And her brothers took pity on this Englishman. And they said, you must get really bored listening to us to, you know, to speak you know, in, in Singaporean all the time, which he didn't know a word of. He said, yes, it's pretty boring, but it's important for my wife. She meets her friends. So his brothers-in-law said, we're going to the racetrack this afternoon. Would you like to come? I know you're not really interested in, in gambling or horse racing, but at least it's an afternoon out and give you something to do. So he agreed. We never knew the customs 
you know, in Malaysia and also Singapore, if you go to the racetrack, you usually go to the lucky temple, first of all. <laughs> so they went to this temple, which they said was really lucky, and when they got there, they found it was very dirty. So they spent an hour cleaning it up. Now that's really good karma. <laughs> so they cleaned it all up, then they went to the racetrack. You know what? They lost. <laughs> <laughs> they lost heavily. But then it was an afternoon out. But that night, the Englishman had a dream. And his dream was also going to a racetrack, betting on a horse, and making lots of money. So the, that morning, when he woke up, he looked in the Straits Times newspaper. And he was also shocked. There was a horse running that afternoon with the very same name as the horse he dreamt of the night before. So what he did, he rang up his brothers-in-law and said, yeah, we lost yesterday, but I had a dream last night. And the dream was of a horse race, and that very horse is running this afternoon. Let's go, we can get our money back. You know what the brothers-in-law said? That was a Singaporean temple. No Singaporean spirits would give the name of a winning horse to an Ang Mo. <laughs> Good, you all know what an Ang Mo is. I don't mind the term Ang Mo. If you go to Hong Kong, it's much worse. They call you Kwai Lo. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, so they refused to believe him. So he went to the racetrack by himself. That horse won. And that really made those brothers-in-law really upset. We're Singaporean, we look after that temple all the time, and these Angmos come in just <laughs> once, and they give the lucky horse to them. This is really unfair. <laughs> and that was a true story. <laughs> so you should look after the Angmo. There's some of the Angmos and spirits in this part of the world. We kind of get on together. Anyway, so a normal phenomenon, yes, you have dreams. But be careful of trying to interpret them. So well done. When meditate, I can't sense a breath in out. What can I do to improve it? Please advise, Ajahn. There was one of uh, my students. They couldn't uh, sense the breath at all when it was going in and going out. They just couldn't do it. So I can't find it. I can't feel it. This wasn't me who taught them this, but whoever whoever did. You know, Sada, Sada, Sada was great advice. The teacher at that time for him said to him, well, if you can't feel the breath, imagine you can feel the breath. Pretend. So pretend, close your eyes, pretend you're watching the breath go in and go out. Imagine what it might feel like. So he did that for about three minutes, just imagining he was feeling the breath. Then the teacher interrupted him and said, what are you watching? And he had to be honest. He said, I'm watching my breath. There was a psychological block there. Even little children can feel the breath. So if you can't feel the breath, why? So imagine you can. Imagine what it must be like to feel the breath. And then stop imagining and you find you can feel it. Try that. If the body feeling I use to watch, eh? If the body feeling I use to watch the pain, is it right? Please advise. Thank you. Don't get too much into pain. It's not just because it's very unpleasant for you. 
but it also gives Buddhism a bad reputation. And especially if it's on my retreat, what do you do on Ajahn Brahm's retreat? I oh, watch the pain. <laughs> no one want to come next time. And quite frankly, that when I started meditating, it wasn't, I was a lay person, it wasn't for watching pain. It was actually for being peaceful, for relaxation, not to understand pain. If you want to understand pain, go to prison. <laughs> or many other thing, places you can go. But to understand peace and stillness, that was really important. And to see the relaxation that gave me. Now, I, I, I've seen so many benefits from learning how to relax even when I was young, how much more these days when we live in a much more fast, competitive world. And if I haven't told you this yet, but I'm sure you've heard it in one of my other talks or you know, other retreats, even online, how I passed my final exams at Cambridge. I was doing uh, theoretical physics. It was Six days of exams, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday in a row, a three-hour exam in the morning, another three-hour exam in the afternoon. I don't think they would get away with torturing the students that much. It was really high pressure on the results of that exam, you'd pass your degree or you wouldn't. So how I dealt with it, and it taught me so much insights and so much success too. We had, I had a big breakfast in the morning, then I went to the exam room. I, and at lunch time, we had an hour for lunch, I never had any lunch for those six days. Instead of having lunch, I went to my room, which was only five minutes away, sat on a cushion and meditated. Every day of those uh, six days. And this is what happened. When I sat down, crossed my legs, the first thing I thought about, I never thought about you know, missing lunch, I thought about what happened in the morning exam. It just, I just finished it. Did I answer those questions correctly? Did I give enough explanation? And straight away, you know, I realized, what are you thinking about? The exam paper is finished, you've submitted it, you can't change it now. Good, bad, it you know, can't be changed. We all know that about the past. Why can't we let it go? A lot of times because you haven't trained in how to let things go. By this time, I've been meditating for a couple of years. I didn't know how to let things go. So the first thing I let go was trying to figure out what happened in the past. A good exam or bad exam. It didn't matter anymore. It was finished. It really was finished. So I let go of the past. And the next thing which came up in my meditation between exams was the future. What's going to come up in the afternoon exam? Should I just stop meditating and just pick up a book and do some last minute revision? Well, the one thing I'd always remembered, many times I'd done that, and you will find what you look at in the last well, half an hour before the exam never comes up in the paper. Never, never once did that happen. I reminded myself the future is uncertain. You can't predict what's coming up and you're wasting your time. So what I needed to do was not to do more study. I needed to prepare my brain to relax it, to energize it. And so the next, I let go of the future. I could do that. And so after I let go of the past and the future, the next thing which came up in my meditation and I was surprised by it. My physical body was shaking. 
I never noticed that before. I don't usually shake because of nerves, but this was real high stress. Final examinations at Cambridge, pass or fail just on these exams. That shocked me. How come I wasn't aware of that before? How many times you get cancers growing in you, you can't see them until it's too late. You can't feel the problems. If you could be more aware of your body, you can catch those illnesses so early and you can actually do something about it. For me, it's just the shaking of the body. All I need is to be aware and to relax. So soon my body became still. It wasn't shaking at all anymore. And of course, you know, if you're shaking like that, that uses up so much energy. But then I noticed, the last thing I noticed every lunch hour was my brain was exhausted. You'd just done a three-hour paper in quantum physics or something. And of course now my brain was all used up. I felt it was like one of these tea bags. It would have been used, there's hardly any energy left in it. I would try and make a cup of tea out of a used tea bag. There was not enough oomph in it. That was like my brain. It was exhausted. But I knew, I teach this to you as well, all you need to do is just to be with it. Don't try and fix it. Don't try and do anything, just to be with it, with kindness. And it recharges. And that's what happened. I just sat with my depleted energy brain for 10 minutes and you could feel all the energy come back into it. So in the afternoon, this is a totally accurate story, in the afternoon, I was fully charged for the afternoon exam. No tiredness, no sort of uh, nerves, brain fully functional, fully charged. And not only did I do well in those exams, but also only afterwards my friends, my colleagues who were doing the same exams, they commented afterwards that I was the only student who went into those examinations on theoretical physics smiling. They thought I was cheating. <laughs> In a sense, I was, but not illegally. I just had this other way of dealing with stress and I found out it worked perfectly. And I've taught that so many times in so many places. One place I taught that was at our local Jewish school, high school. The rabbi at that school was a friend of mine, Rabbi Moshe Bernstein. He became a friend because just chatting to him, he said, we believe in reincarnation too. I said, Jewish, do you? He said, oh yeah. It's the first time I heard that. But then I saw another senior rabbi in Australia. And he said, no, we don't. He said, but a rabbi told me that. Which rabbi? Moshe Bernstein. Oh yeah, he's a bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> he was rebellious, that's why he became a friend. <laughs> I liked his views, it was like controversial, but he thought for himself. So anyway, one year he happened to be the chaplain at this Jewish high school in Perth. And he was telling me that the exams they were going to have for the university entrance, they were really looking at a very bad results. The kids weren't doing well at all in the pre-exam preparation. Ajahn Brahm, can you come in to help our kids? And of course I said, yes, you're a friend. I always look after friends. So I went in there and spent the day with the, uh, the year six students, the ones preparing for the university entrance exams, and taught them about meditation. And I only tell this story, of course, because the results were fantastic. A few weeks later, after the exams, when they were, they were published, I never looked at the newspapers, I never knew this, 
that school got the best results of a high school in the whole of Western Australia. And the, the principal, the headmaster, sent me this letter, thank you for teaching our children. They did so, so well. I don't know why I wasn't invited the next year or the year afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, it proved it does work. So this is actually where you learn. This thing called meditation, you can see how it works. It relaxes all the stress and allows you to perform you know, to the height of your abilities. Even also, recently, I don't know how many of you are into sports, but recently they had the Women's World Cup Soccer over in Australia. And one evening on a Friday I was preparing to give a talk and this woman came in, I've never seen her before. She said she was the coach of the Jamaican soccer team. And she said she always listens to my talks and the guided meditation on YouTube. And her team was going to play another team in Perth in a couple of days' time. So she took the opportunity to come in, see the centre, listen to a talk, and just to say thank you. So she was the head coach of the Jamaican soccer team, women's soccer team. And so I asked her, how are you going? She said, well, you know, just, we're only Jamaican soccer team, we don't get much support. So but at least we're at the World Cup. Then after I gave her some instructions, they won the next round. No one expected them to. It's incredible sometimes when you give people some instructions on how to relax and how you can perform to the highest of your abilities. It actually works. Sydney Olympics, going back earlier. In the Sydney Olympics, uh, the Australian government had different members of different religions in the Olympic village in Homebush Bay in Sydney in case any athlete or their family needed some religious support. Because that too was a high stress competition, Olympic Games. And I saw this printed in the Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald, I think, or something, one of the daily newspapers in Sydney. The story of how this athlete from Eastern Europe somewhere, she managed to get herself into the finals of a, one of the sprints, I don't know, 800 meters or something, and she never expected to do that well. This was in 2000, the Sydney Olympics. And so she got stressed out. And one morning, this athlete and her mother and father came to see the monk, a Buddhist monk, he was Thai, who was at the Olympic Games to give support to any sort of Buddhist who needed it. Now this was not a Buddhist. She wasn't a Buddhist, her parents were, weren't Buddhist, but they knew that Buddhists had the understanding of meditation. And meditation was important for relaxation. So they asked the monk, can you teach our daughter a little bit about meditation so she can relax? We're not Buddhists, but just you know, teach us meditation. So the monk did that. He was a good teacher. And he never looked at the TV or knew what happened. He just saw this family coming towards him just one day, and they were all smiling. You could see that from a distance. There was the mum and the dad, and the athlete was in the middle. And as they came closer, you can see the smiles were pretty big. And then he noticed that the, the daughter in the middle was swinging something on a string. When he came closer, he saw the colour was gold. She'd actually won the gold medal 
in a sprint event at the Sydney Olympic Games. That's why it was recorded in the newspaper. And they said, thank you for teaching our daughter how to relax and get a good night's sleep before the event so she could exceed what other people thought was possible for her. How many people from Penang have won a gold medal at the Olympics? <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> I would expect as one of you have been to one of my retreats. Because <laughs> you can understand how it works. A lot of time, people are just so stressed, so tense, they can't live up to their potential. They can train, have a very fit body, but it's the mind isn't there to compete. So that's one of the reasons why this meditation is huge. And I'm sure that when people know how to do it properly, not tensing up, but learning how to relax to the max, how each one of you can improve your performance no matter what you do. Okay, that's I said that one already. Why is quite so weird that when the mind is tired, but when I look at the scenery, it's still clear and beautiful. From one of the yogi attending morning interviews, thank you, Ajahn Brahm. When the mind is tired, but when you look at the scenery, it's still clear and beautiful. I think that's probably because you're not interfering just with the process of just looking and enjoying. A lot of times the reason why we do block out the beauty, our potential, because we think too much, we expect so much. But it's even better when you've been still in meditation and your mind energizes, really energizes. When it really energizes, I've said many stories already, but some of those stories is, you look at the floor in front of you, you've got the, the tiles there, I've got this incredibly beautiful wooden floor, I don't know if it's plastic or whether it's real, but it certainly looks good. And you can see more of it. I have mentioned an English poet, William Blake, who once wrote, to see a world in a grain of sand. Can you see a whole world in just a tiny grain of sand? If you have mindfulness and the kindness, you can hold something and keep your mind on it for a while. It's amazing what you see. It's not just a grain of sand, it's got texture, it's got shape. Even the different shades of yellow or grey, whatever colour the sand is, it's not the same throughout the whole grain of sand. It's a tiny thing. You can see so much beauty in it. See a heaven in a wild flower. Oh my goodness, you know what wild flowers, well they call them wild flowers, because they're usually very tiny. We have a wildflower season over in Western Australia and these are tiny, tiny flowers. But they've got such incredibly diverse and rich colours. So much so that many tourists come to see those wildflowers. And they are beautiful. To see a heaven in a wildflower, most people just walk right past them. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand. Wow. And that is, what does that mean? Infinity. You're not bound by anything, not space, not age, not time, not knowledge, not wisdom or anything. All those bounds and barriers are taken off. And you have it in the palm of your hand. You have it already. And eternity in an hour. That means when you're listening to one of my talks, it goes on and on. <laughs> No, it doesn't. An hour is just rhymed with flower, that's all. It means a small bit of time, and the time loses its meaning. That's what happens. 
when you start meditating. Just some of these things which imprison you in their meanings are broken and you feel so free. So that's what happens. You're tired, but when you energize, wow. If you can keep the stillness not interfering, then what you see is incredible. And this is normal, you're not taking any drugs, it's just the mind is getting energized. As the signs of aging are emerging, such as body aches and pains, forgetfulness, prone to falling, etc., the feeling of vulnerability and fear arises. How to deal with the feeling of vulnerability to life's uncertainties? How would I know about aging? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I live with some very kind monks. Many years, I should say many years ago, a couple of years ago, I said that I was getting old. You know what my monks said? They were just so sweet. They said, Ajahn Brahm, you're not getting old. You're not getting old. I thought, oh, thank you, that's so nice of you. You're not getting old because you are already old. <laughs> but you have advantages when you get old. Forgetfulness. I love teaching sort of old people. You know why? I can tell them the same joke every week. <laughs> and they forget, it's always new to them. <laughs> and broadly, there are advantages of aging, and there are disadvantages. Don't just think of the disadvantages. One of the advantages is you can retire. You don't have to work. And also, your caregivers. You don't have to do many of the jobs you had to do when you were young. Now you can be more free. You know, young people, you know, they have to learn about the internet. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You just give it to someone else. Can you fix this for me, grandson? And they're great at that. So, you're free of so many jobs and responsibilities. You don't have to be fit or look beautiful anymore. But a lot of people are afraid of old age. Someone showed me this story only recently. You may not know that some of those books, I know those books on the back there, but some of the books which I wrote were very well received internationally. And one of those books was a book called Opening the Door of Your Heart. Have you read that book? Yeah. So has Sarah Jessica Parker. She was a film actress in the United States. She was photographed in a coffee shop reading Opening the Door of Your Heart with my name on it. And I thought, wow, even I know her name as a famous TV actress. And so I thought, if she really likes my book, she'll probably ask me to come and do a cameo in her TV show. Until I found out her TV show was called yeah, you know it. <laughs> Sex in the City. Imagine with a cameo performance of Ajahn Brahm from Australia. <laughs> that would be very embarrassing. And so just joking around with your fellow monks, we thought, no, I have to change the title just for that one episode. No Sex in Monastery. <laughs> But the reason I mention that now, that someone showed me another article about Sarah Jessica Parker. She is one of the few actresses who were famous for being young and beautiful, who is now old 
but doesn't wear, wear any makeup, doesn't dye her hair, doesn't have implants, doesn't have cosmetic surgery. She does look like an, a woman of her age. And that is so rare. I think it's because she read my book. <laughs> She'll probably sue me. <laughs> so when life becomes uncertain, just be with it, go with it. It makes life much more easy when you are honest with your aging process. And you don't try to look young, to dye your hair, wear wigs, or whatever else people do to try and look young. Is that a good idea? No, someone said. Okay. Dear Ajahn, can meditation help early signs of dementia? Thank you. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> of course it can. Why? Because you're not exhausting your brain. But you're still keeping it bright and happy. Forgetfulness and memory, one of the other meanings for sati, for mindfulness, is having a good memory. They use those two words almost interchangeably in Buddhism. So it's to be expected if the Buddha was being honest, which obviously he was, when he said that a sign of good mindfulness is you can remember many, many things. That's a sign you've been practicing mindfulness. So of course it does. Dear Venerable, what can we do to get our young children to be interested in meditation? Our children are aged 24 and 28. <laughs> now the way to do this, and this is in the Buddhist suttas, Anatta Pindika. Now, Nata Pindaka was one of the Buddha's chief supporters. He had a son, and his son was not interested at all in Buddhism. He wouldn't even give arms round to the Buddha when the Buddha came past his house. So what can you do to get a boy like that interested in Buddhism? Anatta Pindika was very smart because you know, his boy, you know, he liked playing around with his friends, you know, playing around, social, socializing, partying, it cost money. So what Anatta Pindika did, he bribed his son. He told his son, for every hour you spend in the Jetavana monastery, where the Buddha lived, for every hour you spend there, I'll give you, I don't know, 30 ringgit. Is that a lot of money? Would that get your son to come to Mahindarama Temple? Thousand ringgit? Would you come? <laughs> but anyway, his father set a price, you don't need to listen to a talk, you don't need to do anything, you don't need to give food or tidy things up, just you're in the compound. And as long as you're in the compound, for every hour you get so much money. And the son thought, that's, that's a nice deal. So the son kept on going to the Jetavana monastery, never listened to a talk, never spoke to a monk, never gave any alms food, just as a nice little way of making some money so he could spend it in the evening. And his father never complained. He knew what would happen. One day, his son was really bored. He didn't want to go to monastery, but he needed the money. So he was there in the monastery grounds. The Buddha was giving a talk, and the son thought, you know, while well, I'm here, I might as well listen. I don't lose any money, don't gain any money, but just for interest. 
and he listened to the Buddha's speech. And when he went back, <laughs> he was totally converted. And I think he gave a lot of the money back to his dad. Thank you. It's called bribery. <laughs> Try it. It works. <laughs> if that doesn't work, the children 24 and 28, that doesn't work. What you can do is, I remember many young Thai men about their age, they would never go to a meditation retreat. But in this one time I was teaching a meditation retreat in Perth, before we had our Jhana Grove Center. And I couldn't believe how many Thai young men had joined my retreat for nine days. Until I found out when I asked, why are all these young men here? And it was because there was a very well-known Thai film actress. <laughs> she came to Perth to do a meditation retreat because she'd get overwhelmed by her fans if she did that retreat in Thailand. And a few of the boys had found out, the word went around in social media, so they were there not to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> they learned to be with the film actress, apparently very beautiful. So, so that's sometimes how to bribe your kids. I don't know, I didn't say the boys or girls, 24 and 28. Suppose they were boys. I do know that there's many, many even famous Malaysians. Very beautiful. There was this one lady, that's right, Sandria. Sandria Ui. Or Ui. She, has, she had her own TV show. She was, you know, supposed to be incredibly beautiful. She was from Malacca. And I just happened to be going to Malacca to give a talk when uh, she found out I was going to be in town on the day she was going to have her marriage. So she thought, this is really lucky, Ajahn Brahm is going to be in town. So she invited me to do the wedding blessing for her. And it was the only celebrity, actually not the only, but the first celebrity wedding which I did, which got a, I think, Vogue newspaper, the Malaysian edition, I got in the glossy magazines. <laughs> There's only one photo of me though, but you know, 20 or 30 of this glamorous Sandria. But because you know that you can give wise teachings about all sorts of things, and the teaching which she liked the most, she's still happily married, the last she was in contact with me, you know, before COVID. She was happily married and she said, the thing which I told her which meant the most was I asked her and her partner, please, on the anniversary of your marriage, or just the day before, day after, whatever is convenient, please, just the two of you, have a dinner or lunch together, just the two of you. And at that lunch, at the very end, please exchange little gifts. Just anything, it doesn't have to be expensive. Whoever does it first, you give, say, a gift to your husband. And you say, darling, anything I've done by body, speech or mind in the last 12 months, which has irritated you or hurt you, either intentional or unintentional, by accident, or anything which I didn't do, which I should have done, I forgot. Please forgive me. I'm not perfect, but I really do love you and I want to try and be perfect. Please forgive me. And if anybody, this is in the suttas, if anybody with sincerity asks forgiveness, you have to forgive them. And then it's the husband's. So he offers a little gift to his wife and says, anything which I have done by speech, by actions, even thoughts on purpose or just by mistake, or things I didn't do which hurt you, 
please forgive me. I really mean that. Now it is one this relationship to work. And that's what they did. They've been doing that every year. They said that was the most important thing to keep the relationship together. That honesty and never trying to feel that you are already perfect. And they thank me for that. That's why celebrity weddings is not just messing around. You really try your best to make sure it's meaningful and can help people stay together. Especially people, when the lady, the girl, is apparently really beautiful and the guy, you know, very successful. Once you explain things like that, your two children, doesn't matter male or female, that actually gets to them and they really want to become better human beings. And they want to have relationships which work. And they come, sometimes they feel surprised. That came from a monk. What does a monk know about marriage? <laughs> I know because this is just relationships. Being able to be at peace with people and harmonious with people. So that's, that's actually how it works. And if you tell stories like that to your kids, they want to come to that to the temple, especially if you buy them as well. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that we shouldn't be afraid of ghosts because they are two worlds below us. But what if you, what if you, what if we, what, what we see are beheaded, sharp teeth, etc. How to save brave. If they're beheaded, they can't harm you. They've got no teeth. <laughs> they can't even see you. They've got no head. They've got sharp teeth. My goodness, just, you know, just give them a toothbrush and they'll probably be very happy. And now they can clean those sharp teeth. Real ghosts don't look like that. Real ghosts just look like an ordinary human being. Very often you don't know it's a ghost sitting next to you. <laughs> okay, ghost story coming. This was a famous one from Thailand. I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's just such a good real story. A doctor in Sirirat Hospital, one of the big hospitals, no, it's just on the other side of the Mekong, not Mekong, of the Chao Phaya River from the, the, the central field in Bangkok and the temples. And he was finishing his shift early one morning, going down to the basement in the elevator for his, getting his car and go home. There was a nurse with him, a witness to what happened. And the elevator stopped halfway down. The, uh, the doors opened and there was a patient trying to get in the elevator. The doctor freaked out and he moved to the close the door button, and pressed it and the elevator door closed before this patient could get in. And the nurse was very embarrassed. Why did you shut that elevator door? There was a patient trying to get in. And that's when the doctor said, that wasn't a patient, that was a ghost. I know because that was one of my patients last night who died. Just this night he died. Are you sure? Yes, said the doctor, because in Thailand, I know this is true, I lived nine years in Thailand. Anyone who dies, especially in the hospital, they put a red string around their wrists. And so that's what the doctor said. Didn't you see the red string around his wrist? That proves he was dead. And at that the nurse said, oh, I've got a red string too. <laughs> Does that mean I can't go in the lift? 
And that, that was a true story. At least that's what the doctors said when they found him fainted, unconscious, <laughs> on the floor of the lift. What happened? And that's what he said. And of course they checked that was his patient who died the night before, or that night, and the lady, the nurse, she died in a car accident on the way to work in the hospital. It was true, there were two ghosts, one outside, one inside. <laughs> so I advise this evening, please use the stairs to go. <laughs> Especially <laughs> that's fair. All they do is faint. They can only get you scared. They can't harm you. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Is it true <laughs> that the level of merits that accrue from giving down to the sanguine temples are more than giving to support the homeless and animals? It so depends. It's not black and white. If it's supporting some monks, <laughs> but if it's giving to like a good Sangha who are actually doing things in the world, you can imagine just what does your ringgit do? And where does it go? And how does it really support and encourage and inspire people to be better human beings? support the homeless and animals. A lot of times, you know, what the monk says, what the Sangha does, does support homeless and animals. We actually, one of the things which we did, I only just got the email a few days ago, you know, at Christmas time, okay, we're Buddhists, but who cares? We always make sure we do something on the 25th of December, actually the 24th of December, we do a collection of these, uh, it's like supermarket gift cards, only about $30 each, to be able to give those gift cards to children in women's refuges. Because a lot of times, even in a country like Australia, Sometimes women have to flee their homes because of domestic abuse. They go with their kids. And the kids stay in these homes, these sanctuaries, you know, because at least, you know, they're not seeing their wife being hit or abused. And this is almost like a last resort, it's supported by the government. But that's not good enough. So when we found out what was happening in there, we managed to get gift cards at Christmas, which we give to the children. I think they're only $30 each. Actually, that's quite a lot of money for a kid, and they can buy a lot of what they want to buy. Not the, the mother doesn't grab them, or can't sort of tell them what to get. A little kid can go to the, the shop and buy toys or whatever they think they want for Christmas thanks to the Buddhist community. And I love stuff like that. Because that's like thinking outside the box, and it's so beautiful to be able to do that. So whatever we can do to help out. So it's not just what I don't like, putting chandeliers in retreat centers or monasteries. Please excuse me, I don't know why the donor did that. But just ordinary lights are more than good enough. I was a Thai monk for many years. I was given a, an award from the King of Thailand many years ago as a Chao Kun for all the hard work which I was doing. But then I remember going to Bodh Gaya in India and I went into the Thai temple and I felt so uncomfortable there. It was like going into a palace. It was just so opulent. And I preferred going into the Sri Lankan temple. In the Sri Lankan temple, 
there was no opulence at all. Instead, there was these big boxes of medications for poor kids, school supplies, they had a free school there for the local kids, medication, you know, all the sorts of things which were actually helping the poor kids. I know if you go to those places, sometimes you see beggars asking for money. And a lot of those aren't real beggars, but they have to beg, otherwise they get beaten by their owners, and sometimes even tortured. It's so sad. But if they go to the Sri Lankan temple, they do get food. They do get medical attention. They do get an education. Simple things. That, and that's why when the people I was leading on pilgrimage say, where should we give a donation? Sri Lankan temple, please. Because that's where the money is doing the best work. Of course we do need retreat centers. But the opulence is something which kind of goes against what I understand as the Buddha's teachings. Does that make sense to you? If we enjoy giving dharma to the Sangha and temples whilst they are wholesome deeds, can it lead to a craving for merit, thus creating an offsetting karmic effect? I don't really feel that's possible. It's not craving for merit. Merit actually costs you. Honestly, if I was not a monk, I'd be giving donations all over the place. Because every time I've given a donation, one of the, these are things I remember from years ago. That once there was this, she was a Tibetan nun who was just running an orphanage in Sikkim in the foothills of the Himalayas and she needed some help. And so after her talk, I couldn't help myself. I just went to my bank and took 20 pound out. That was way more than I can afford. That was two weeks food money for me. I went hungry afterwards. But I never forget that donation. That was the best gift I've ever done. And that was 60 years ago. I've never forgotten it. Maybe that's a, no, 50 years ago. 55 years ago. I've never forgotten that. It gives me so much joy and happiness. Yeah, two weeks food money. I had to give up, but I made up for it these days. <laughs> <laughs> but the joy and the happiness was amazing. If a person does a lot of charitable donations or support to the homeless and animal shelters, will their attachment to these causes lead to rebirth in any unwholesome states? No. I don't think so, but I've been told it would. Just wanted to clarify. Very, very, very unlikely. You're doing good work. It doesn't mean you want to be sort of a homeless person or be in an animal refuge yourself. You're just being kind. It's a wonderful thing to do. I support it. Where can we find if we want, where can we find you if you want to offer dana with metta? You'll find me hiding away somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often, we have a saying in the West, I'm sure you must have heard it by now, you don't pay it back, you pay it forward. Instead of, I help you and you come and help me back, that's not the way to do it. I help you, you go and help somebody else. That's how Ajahn Chah taught me, he said, you don't need to say thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for all the teachings I've given you. If I have helped you, said my teacher Ajahn Chah, then you must go out and help somebody else. And tell them that's what you need to do as well. And that way the help goes on and on and on and on. Giving donations is one way. It's much more than that. It's giving your time. Giving forgiveness. Giving kindness. Somebody asks you for something. Just some help, say a lift, you know, back back home somewhere. And then you say, well, there's space in the car, I don't see why not come in. 
that kindness is beautiful. And that's what inspires me in this life. Yeah, we do. I've got to say this, otherwise I'll get in trouble. We do always have Ajahn Brahm's projects. And the latest one, I'm going to announce it now because you may have heard about it already, is the Bhikkhuni Monastery in England. You know, Bhikkhunis have done it very hard. It's a Thai, not Thai, this is Theravada fully ordained nuns. You've heard that I sacrificed all my friends in Wat Bapong, got kicked out of Wat Bapong for giving them ordination. They needed that. Why not? So you don't just ordain somebody. You've got to train them. Make sure they've got a place to live. Honestly, just ordaining somebody is like giving birth to somebody. You just can't just have a kid and think they're going to look after themselves. You've got to feed them, give them a home, nurture them, train them until they can be independent. So that's my job. So I've done that to so many monks over this time. I've got so many monasteries I'm supposed to be looking after. But those, those ones can usually look after themselves. But the bhikkhunis, fully ordained Buddhist nuns, got a be beautiful monastery over in Perth, Damasara. Another one over in Sydney, a couple in Sydney. No, one in Sydney, sorry, one in Melbourne. But it's still, it needs some more. There's a bhikkhuni monastery over here in, uh, outside of KL as well. It's growing. But they've never been able to manage to get one over in England. And I kind of feel responsible there because that's where I was born. That's my, where I've got so many friends from my youth. So anyway, last June, so last, actually last month, only in November. Crikey, time goes so fast. We found a place just outside of Oxford. It's beautiful. It's got a wonderful house on it. It's got acres of land, big forest, and it's quiet, accessible. And so we put in an offer for it, and the offer's been accepted. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> We've got a bhikkhuni monastery over in the UK. And they still keep telling me they still need some more funds, you know, to actually to put in an office, fix up the heater. There's things which are wrong with it, but not that much. So because of that, that's my latest project. And I do it not just for status. It's more work for me. I just do that because I want to see it happen. I'm passionate about it. So any one of you, or your daughters, they may want to, not all of them will do that, they may want to live monastic life, just as men can. I want to give them that opportunity, make it possible for them. One of the exciting stories, again, I never forget, when I was trying to raise funds for the nuns monastery, Bikuni monastery in, in Perth. We were getting hardly anywhere. We had about $30,000 in the bank. And that's nowhere near enough to actually buy enough land and start doing buildings for a Bikuni monastery. And then one day I got a phone call. There was an Australian man. I'd never seen him before in my life. But he said his wife had just given birth to their first child, who happened to be a daughter. And he said, I want to do something to celebrate my daughter's birth, my first child. He said he was a Buddhist. He had heard that I was really working hard to establish equity for females in Buddhism. And so he said, can I come and give a donation to your nun's monastery? I said, yeah, sure. I never expected much. 
when he arrived, it was in an old car, he was just wearing thongs and shorts. And he asked again, are you really going to build a nun's monastery? I said, yes. And he handed over a check for $250,000. I never seen that big a check before. Please excuse me, maybe you don't expect a monk to do this, but I was shaking as I was <laughs> that really shocked me. And I never saw him again. For years I thought this was probably a heavenly being. But then eventually they I gave so many talks that he contacted me and said, No, I'm not a heavenly being. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that this monastery happens, which it did. And that was the thing which took us over the kind of possibilities for struggle to actually happening. And things like that have inspired me all the years I've been a monk. So if anyone has got a spare $250,000... <laughs> no, I think we got some fundraising things in the back. We have over there. Okay, you can see it in the back anyway. Anyone interested, just go and ask one of the organizers. But whenever there's any dana, please, no compulsion. If you have to, don't. But if you feel that's inspiring for you, you want to see these things happen, go for it. It's inspired me all my life, seeing just what you've created. It's not just giving talks, it's not the number of monks and nuns. It's even doing amazing things like getting Venerable Kai Sri to be such a good friend, a fellow monk, different tradition, who cares? But just to have that working together ethos, that's gorgeous. And to get places where people, even in monasteries which I run if you like, you can be gay and ordained, you can be lesbian and ordained, you can be transgender and ordained. I try and do my best to stand up and protect you. So if that's what you really feel like you want to do in life, do it. So it's okay anyway. So anyway, those things are in the back of that. Oh my goodness. This talk is going to go on to about 11 o'clock tonight. <laughs> I'll try and be quick, but I do get passionate as well. There's things I, in my life I love doing. A lay person realized he attained Arya Sotapanna. He is telling others he attained. Can he do that? It's a stupid thing to do to tell others. Why do you want to tell others? Because certainly one who is an Aryan on the stages of enlightenment, they should be humble. Have you ever heard me make claims about what I can do, what I can't do? I will not do that. You can see my, by my behavior, by my actions. That will tell you more than any personal claims. Sometimes people ask me, how do you know if someone really is enlightened? The rule of thumb is, if they claim to be enlightened, they certainly aren't. <laughs> ah, Ajahn Brahm, is abortion at any stage of pregnancy against the first precept? No, it's not always against the first precept. And I say that you know, just because as a scientist trying to be logical, the birth Parmati Pata means destroying a, a life, something who is a being. And the Buddha described that birth has to happen once the stream of consciousness from the previous life enters a mother's womb. And it can't do that the first days after conception. You know, the, the egg and the sperm need to combine together first of all. And it usually, a long time before the stream of consciousness actually says manifests in a mother's womb. And to me, that means that once that um, being in the mother's womb is grown enough 
you know, to actually to show a nervous system which can respond to pleasure and pain. Before it has grown those neurons or whatever else is needed, it's not considered to be an independent being. It's dependent, depending upon its mother's consciousness, not its own. It doesn't qualify as a being. I'm not quite sure what that time is. I tried to find out years ago, but couldn't really get a definitive answer. When that thing growing in, please call it a thing, uh, is growing in the mother's womb, when it can respond to pleasure or pain, from that point on, as consciousness has manifested in the mother's womb, and I take that to be the beginning of life. Before that, it's not called Parnati Pata. Some of you may uh, argue with me, but when I saw that and it makes sense to me, that's a little bit of help for the women in this room who've had abortions. And I noticed that's never a decision which you make lightly. That has enormous consequences on you. And basically, I feel so much, I do, I'm not just making this up, compassion and sympathy for you. A really difficult decision, there it is, and you make that decision. My job will never ever be to criticize you. My job will be to support you in whichever way I can. Ah, oh. dear Venerable Kai Si. <laughs> There's two of them here for you. <laughs> no, you've got to respect. Please elaborate on the process of the cultivation of meditative insight, wisdom that leads to severance of self-identity view. So what you can do, you're going to be, you're going to be here tomorrow for the, um, the chanting in the morning. So you can do that then. I am always fearful of sickness. Every single illness made me worry of the worst possibility. What should I do to alleviate the fear? Remember about this guy. I'm going to answer this for you. He went to his doctor, what's wrong? He said, everything is wrong. Everything hurts. What do you mean, everything hurts? Well, I touch my head and it hurts. <laughs> my nose hurts, my ear hurts, my mouth hurts, and just my tummy hurts. <laughs> everything hurts. And the doctor said, sir, your finger is broken. <laughs> okay. Oh, this, this other guy, he was an old guy, went to see the doctor and he says, I think I've got COVID, all the types of COVID. And I think I've got anger <laughs> down there somewhere. I think I've got all the diseases there ever was. He's like a hypochondriac. And the doctor said to this old guy, look, you have so many diseases, what haven't you got? And he said, teeth? <laughs> he was an old guy. He hadn't got any teeth. Okay, you know, I thought that was funny. <laughs> okay. One who is rich and wealthy, but does not want to spend on good food and good, good clothing. Why is it so? He eats and dresses stingily. Why? A lot of time when a person gets wealthy, they do that because they are stingy. They're afraid of wasting money. What's the purpose of money? Of course, the purpose of money is to make sure that it's used. It's not just money in the bank. It's used to create happiness and peace and solve suffering in the world. So sometimes if ever, the best thing to try and do is to make donations a little bit every year, but just so the last year of your life when you die, that's when you finally run out of money in the bank. <laughs> the trouble is we don't know when we're going to die, so we can't actually do that. But anyway, you're rich and wealthy, you know, what's that there for? Money is there to be used, not to be kept. 
for other people, especially. Oh, another Kaisi question. You're going to be very busy tomorrow morning. Another one, dear Shifu. I'm not Shifu, I'm a venerable. <laughs> dear Venerable, okay, that's me. <laughs> what are, kindly share with us, what are the indicators to tell us that our practice are going in the right direction? Thank you so much. Good question. It's because you get on with others very easily. You go home from a retreat and you're a much better wife, a much better husband, a much better son, a much better daughter, a much better parent much better everything. Very often, even children see that. Children have some honesty, I'm talking about five or six year olds, seven year olds. This woman, you know, she said, she used to come to our meditation group every Tuesday in Armadale. But then she came home from work one day and she said, I'm too tired to go to meditation this evening. And her two kids said, Mommy, you must go to meditation. <laughs> and she said, I don't want to go, I'm tired. Mommy, you must go to meditation. Why? And the kids replied, because you are a much nicer mummy after you come home from meditation. <laughs> then you know your practice is bearing fruit. Kids are great measurers because they have a kind of honesty. They don't know how to deceive yet, at least not very well. So that tells you that your meditation is going well. I have to be quite quick now. Another Kaisi, oh, lots of Kaisi ones. <laughs> yes, Shifu, yes, another one. <laughs> I thought I was going to go on forever, but I'm going to be leaving at 10 o'clock and you can carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll do that. When we are sick and doing meditation, which part we have to focus on, our breathing or the body part and that pain? If you are really sick, don't choose what you're going to focus on. First of all, make yourself comfortable. I'm talking about the time I had um, what was it called? Uh, yeah, scrub typhus for about three or four weeks. So after you experience nothing worked, nothing was being cured. After you experience a fever like that for a few weeks, you get really exhausted. And so there's no way I could sit up to meditate. I was just laying down on the bed, legs all over the place, an arm here, an arm there. However my body felt, it could just relax. And then I said, present moment awareness, whatever is here right now, that is what I'm going to watch. It was the Emperor's three questions. And how I'm going to watch it is just to be kind. You had to keep it simple. Because when you are sick, you know, you're drained of energy, and you hurt, you can't just choose to watch your breath and block everything else out. You've got no energy for that. Now the only time I have, what I'm aware of right now, which was just the fever and the tiredness and the general ache which you have when you've had a fever for a few weeks. And also just uh, being aware of uh, just being kind. I can always care for things, I can't always cure them. And that's what I did, and that's what I encourage other people to do. Can you be aware of the present moment? People answer yes. Can you be aware of what's happening now? Yes. Can you be kind? Yes. Then you can meditate. That's what it is. If you say watch the breath, you can't do that. You say sit cross legged, you can't do that. Keep it simple and then it works. Wow, this is the best question ever.
That's got me stumped. <laughs> Blank sheet of paper. Whoever wrote that, well done, you're fully knighted. Come up here and I'll bow to you. <laughs> oh, she threw. No, that's. I'll, I'll leave it for you. How many questions did you answer last night? <laughs> Only four. <laughs> Can you please explain more about heavenly beings and how humans become heavenly beings? Thank you. Can you teach us how to deal with discomfort during meditation, such as hunger, body pain, frustration, and other negative emotions? Look at those emotions, say it's hunger, see the positive side of it. Whenever I experience hunger, I think, great, I'm on a diet. <laughs> it's going to be healthy for me. I don't have to go to the toilet tonight and see the most beautiful piece of thing I've ever done before. I'm not going to say that again. About heavenly beings and how humans become heavenly beings. Now what happens usually is when you die, if you don't have negativity, but you realize that this is the body passing away, and it feels dying is painful, but once you go past that dying point, the death is actually very peaceful and free. When most people die because of some injury or because they're very old, and even if you have things like a cancer, it's just very heavy on you, and now you're free of that. It just is a natural form of happiness, like you've been in a prison and now you're released. You've been working and now you've got not days off, but years off. And if you don't have a negative, a negative mind, you can have a wonderful time after you've died. Just that happiness will show that you can incline to a happy rebirth in a heaven realm. But you don't get reborn as a baby in heaven. You don't have to go to school in heaven. <laughs> you don't have to work in heaven. It's just, it's heavenly. You just arise as a fully formed human being. You don't age in heaven, except at the very, very end when your body starts to fade away, and then you know the time in heaven is almost gone. But a sense of like stability all the time. So it's a very lovely place to be. Also, do you deserve to be in heaven? For so many people, when they die, they have some guilt. If you can settle all of that guilt before you die, then heaven is really easy. If you don't, you think, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that. I had an opportunity to do some good, but I never did. That negativity will not allow you to go into a nice heaven realm. Please be kind, be compassionate to yourself. Remember all your good qualities and just forgive all the bad ones. If I bribe a policeman for a traffic offence, do I break a precept? <laughs> you break the law. <laughs> but if you're, the traffic officer is your son, and you, and you bribe him to go to the temple, not because of a traffic offence, no problem. Can a monk be given a a menu to order food. Yes, they, I shouldn't have said this, but yes, they can. And you know, honestly, sometimes to ask the monk what they need. Because you know, you've, since I've been here, you've given me lots and lots of gifts. You know, just when you come up afterwards some Sangadana, and it's so, so kind of you but then I will always accept them because you gave them to me. But of so many of those things, I don't need them. And so many of those things I have to give to Chao Po and his friends. So they take some of those robes to a nice monastery to share them. 
and some of the other things which you give me, some of the medicines, I will never use. I'm a healthy person. And to be able to take them back to Perth would be such heavy baggage. So it's nice when you want to offer something, <coughs> but it's nice if you can find out you know, what a monk needs, how little they need. I don't know how many people have offered me a comb. <laughs> they say, well, 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 that's a kind of thought. People offer me socks. I don't wear them. But nevertheless, you say, well, can't you share them with your monks? Yeah, but the baggage, we do make socks. They are, they are available in Australia. So, one of the nicest things you can offer me is just a smile and a thanks and then noting that you are practicing well. You don't do this to get funds and to get requisites. I do this just to see you all smiling and being happy. Simple as that. So order many to order food. Sometimes we do that. And the reason is because then I can get something simple. So often, if you see all the food which you get me, I thought you liked this. I thought you liked this. And the amount of food you put in the plate, even today, you know, you made special arrangements to get some food at Mahindarama for me. And just, there's so much stuff on the plate. No way you can eat it all. I feel... Honestly, I'm being truthful now. That's actually why I do get fat. I eat too much because I don't want to disappoint you. It's not what I want to eat, it's just I just want to make sure that you're happy. Dear Ajahn Brahm, may I humbly ask, when will you be in Hong Kong giving meditation retreat? Thank you. May you be well, happy and smile a lot. When I'll be in Hong Kong, that's in the future. How many times have I said live in the present moment? <laughs> Beginning of March. <laughs> Next year. They told me about it. I've got to get the title for the talks. So I'm going to... But anyway, you can actually just key in. Where Ajahn Brahm? Where is Ajahn Brahm? You can find out where I am. Sometimes... Honestly, I travel around so much, I wake up in the morning and open my eyes. Where am I? <laughs> oh, yeah, got a question, yeah. Go on. Sorry, I'm going to ask Yes. And another car owner, PFQ 6393, located at the Wilmington, put up the headlight. I repeat, car number, PLE 9701, and car number, PFQ 6393. Okay. Okay, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Do I jump up? Thank you for all the answers I received from you. Now, from you over six days of insight from awesome sharing and teaching, which was originally the doubts and questions I had in my mind. I shared with one of my children that I have the most beautiful time of attending a 10 days laughing and smiling meditation retreat with Ajahn Brahm. Truly blissful. Certainly keep on practicing stillness, loving kindness, compassion letting go and forgiveness. That's very nice for you to say that. It's not just for yourself, it's for your children and friends as well. It helps them and inspires them. There's nice things going on in Mahindarama temple and stuff. Dear Ajahn, can I apply ointment? Eh? Oh, ointment to minimize the body pain while meditating. Of course you can. <laughs> Depends what ointment it is, but if it minimizes the pain but still keeps your mindfulness aware, 
There's no trouble there at all. So it's okay to take medication uh, to actually to help meditation. A husband and wife were separated for eight years, but they did not divorce. The husband found a new partner and stayed together. Does the husband break the precept and is he still married or separated? That's kind of a legal question, but I reckon because they, they were separated for eight years, if they were really separated but not legally divorced, I would actually say no problem at all. They found a new partner, carry on. The other partner should know that it's separated and finished. If both people know it's finished, even though it might not be legally finished, I can't see a problem. But it would make it much easier just uh, to have that divorce. That makes sense? Okay, well, I might be getting old and... Dear Ajahn, what is the most important practice of liberation? What should we prioritize? Are the following se sequence correct? Meditation, learning the Dharma, doing Dharma. That's pretty good, but I would also include meditation, keeping your precepts, number two, learning the Dharma and maybe doing Dharma. Don't forget the power of your virtue. And it's not just keeping precepts, it's like your kindness your virtuous behavior, being a good person. That helps enormously with your meditation. Dear Ajahn, are we living in a dream state? Some of you are, because when I look when you meditate it. <laughs> no. Eventually everything ceases, only consciousness remains. It's just emptiness. Even consciousness finishes as well. That's a cool one. Nothing left at all. Gone, baby. Gone. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting up. It's getting late. How does one overcome the wrath of being underestimated, undervalued and humiliated by nature? That person is highly self-critical and has a high degree of self-doubt usually fighting back, being assertive and passive-aggressive helps solve the problem. It's bad karma for the doer. What's a karmically optimal solution to the situation? Thanks, Ajahn Bhav. The best solution there is to, to uh, be associating with good, positive people. Yeah, it's hard to uh, associate with someone who's as wrathful and self-critical and self-doubtful, fighting back and assertive and passive-aggressive. They're not the best of people to live with. But if you can be with them, or have them in a group, after a while, they actually feel they don't need to behave like that anymore. It's the associating with the wise, like the elephant I talked about this morning. The elephant associates with good people, he becomes a good elephant. Virtue, like COVID, is contagious. So please don't get inoculation against virtue. How does a person perform the function of remembering if they've let go of their clinging to the aggregates, including Sanya perception. The function of remembering. If it's like, first of all, if it's something worth remembering, then of course you've let go of many attachments, but you don't let go of every attachment. Please, I don't care how enlightened you are, but please don't let go of attachment where, and when you're on the back seat of a motorbike. <laughs> going through Penang traffic, attached to the person in front of you. <laughs> Ajahn Bhan, because of the first precept, does it mean if you're in a Buddhist, Buddhist something, I'll put in, if you're a Buddhist, there are some professions you should not take on, e.g. a butcher, a farmer, 
a veterinary surgeon. Obviously, a butcher is not the best of professions to do. A farmer, there's vegetarian, vegetable farmers, depending on what farmer. A veterinary surgeon. You know, there's many veterinarians who do have problems with that job because sometimes they're required, they say, you know, to, to euthanize an animal. But you have the same problem because sometimes that animal may be your pet. And I think I told you already the solution to that because you can't avoid it. Well, you can get another job not being a veterinarian, but you, know, you can't just, you have a pet, a dog or a cat, you can't just say, I'm not going to bother with this. You, know, you take it to the vet to be euthanized, or you let it die in pain at home. Both are just really problematical. So the solution is, and vets should do this as well, ask the dog, ask the cat whether it's had enough and, and wants to die. And if there is some, if you're sensitive enough, you know the answer to that so easily. You hold the cat in your arms. Have you had enough? And you're sensitive to listen quietly to the answer. And you just know that cat wants to keep on going for a little while longer. So you just say, no, not now. And then when the day comes and it doesn't get better, and that cat says to you, he you hear it, you interpret it, but it's your cat, you, you're pretty accurate. The cat will say, I can't stand it any longer. Please put me down. Then it's the cat's choice. It's not your choice. And then that mitigates you know, the, the fear of, did I kill that being? No, you didn't. It chose to die. Do I jump on? Because of the first... Oh, yeah, okay, yes. That's true. Don't know what I did. Dear Ajahn, is it disrespect to meditate inside bedroom without Buddha and immediately after yoga, still wearing a yoga suit? No, it's not disrespectful at all. Please meditate anywhere. So the disrespect is not towards the place or to what you're wearing. You're respecting the process of meditation. You're doing the best you possibly can. So please, anywhere you need to meditate, meditate there. I've already said that sometimes if you're working in an office and you need a quiet place to meditate, one of the best places to meditate is in the, they call it bathroom, yeah, the restroom. <laughs> it's quiet in there. And you can actually sit down, it's comfortable. And you've got a good excuse. If the boss says, why did you spend half an hour in the toilet? So because I was constipated, <laughs> mentally. I separated from my ex-boyfriend more than 40 years ago. Crikey. But he still comes into my dream once in a while. Even today, when I am in a retreat, why is it so? Sometimes it's because you try to keep him out of your dreams. So whatever happens in the dream, say, welcome, let it come in. That's part of your past, the memories, good or bad. It doesn't mean you're going to carry on with your relationship anymore. It just, it came in. And if you let it come in and learn from it, it usually stops coming in. Dear Ajahn, in my sittings during my calm, your image came in during my knowing. Can I take it as a nimitta? No, I'm not a nimitta, I'm a jambra. <laughs> but honestly, it's a good sign. If you want to turn it into a nimitta, then you look at something, you know, in the image of Ajahn Brahm, whatever's in your mind, which is beautiful and simple. And sometimes, you know, if it's just like the tip of the nose, it's not really beautiful, but it's something simple. Especially if you see a little glistening light in there somehow, a twinkle. Once you see something beautiful in that image, simple in that image, 
can very easily zoom in on that and it becomes a nimitta. I don't know many times I've mentioned the usual one was when I was <coughs> um, just watching this image of a landscape, you know, rolling hills, a river in the bottom, and some trees. I did notice on the tip of one of the leaves on the twigs of that tree there was a dewdrop and it was twinkling in the morning sunshine. And that twinkle was all I needed. I zoomed in on that and that became a gorgeous limiter. If it's complicated, it's very difficult for that limiter to develop. If it's simple, it can. <laughs> Dear Giggle Terror, I mentioned why people call me Giga Terror, because after 10 years, you're Maha Terror, your terror. 20 years Mahatera, 30 years Megatera, 40 years you are Gigatera. That's what they have over in um, Theravada Buddhism. Next year I will be Terra Terra. <laughs> 50 years is the month. The fragrance of sandalwood flows along the wind. The fragrance of the virtues, virtuous one, spreads in every direction. We're imbued with the essence to Ajambram Cologne. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Alas, the end is nigh. But it doesn't have to be this way. Can the organizer withhold Ajahn Brahm's flight ticket and keep Ajahn here for a few extra days? <laughs> nice try. <laughs> That's why I haven't told you when my flight is. If I did, I don't know what you might get up to. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I see a very sharp green colour light before I fainted in my younger age. This happens a few times and the same green light appear. I think you asked me this in interview time. I want to ask Ajahn, is the same green colour light will appear as an image when I have stillness in meditation? Unlikely. It would probably be other colours. Very beautiful, very serene. You won't faint. Migraine. migraine? Oh, really? Okay, but you don't have migraines when you have limiters. If it's a green light and you're having a migraine, then it would have uh, nothing to do with limiters. Limiters, you actually you get inside the migraine where you can't feel it and it disappears. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. I wanted to ask, how do we handle politics at work? It seems that people will be from their group and being a neutral person, most of the time I stand alone. Sometimes it's a disadvantage to me. I don't have politics at work. <laughs> you know, my, my work's in a monastery. So you try, if you can, to have time to speak to people to be friends with people. And when people just want you know, to get on in their office, to be the boss, please, they must be so stupid to want to be the boss. The only reason I became the boss in Bodhinyana Monastery, I had it all sorted out. I was a number two monk. And the number one monk, he was, seemed to be very stable and senior to me, doing a good job. And I was like tailgating. The one in the front is like the car which gets all the mosquitoes on the windscreen. If you're behind, you don't get bugs on the windscreen. So I was having a wonderful time just being a number two monk until the number one monk fell in love and he disrobed. <laughs> anyway, still it's a great service to do. But you don't want to do the service. And also, being in a monastery, the senior monk does not have authority. The authority decisions in Bodhinyana Monastery, honestly, are made by a Sangha. It is one of the oldest forms of democracy still continuing, 2,500 years, when the summit to decide, I can put my hand up and say, we'll do it this way, we'll do it that way. I can't do that. 
So all the monks come together. In a nuns monastery, all the nuns come together. And they have to make a decision unanimous. If there is, you know, some say, no way I'm going to agree to that. You know, one of the things, a good example of that, is just over a year ago, that we want, we have lots of solar power in Australia. So I wanted to make sure we got a solar powered vehicle, like electric vehicle. And we did our research, the cheapest and the best form of uh, electric vehicle, fully electric, not hybrid, was a Tesla. And then some of the monks said, no, I'm never going to allow any donations to go into the pocket of Elon Musk. <laughs> well, it's the best vehicle available, but I don't care. I, I don't like that guy. So sometimes we have problems making decisions. So what we usually do, okay, let's take a vote, see how it's going. And it was about, you know, we have about 21 or 22 monks at the monastery in Perth. So I think it came out about 24 and two against. It doesn't mean we can do anything yet. Just we made it sure what the majority of people wanted to do. And the two monks who didn't want to get a Tesla, it's all sponsored. They don't want to get a Tesla. Can you still get one? Because the majority of monks want one. And so they just conceded. So we had a vote and it was all unanimous. That's how things are done in monasteries, how they should be done, which means the politics doesn't get there. We can't have groups. We're supposed to be in harmony together and showing that harmony. Dear Ajahn, if we are too attached, obsessed to our pets, because they're so cute and lovable, do we turn into a milder version of Sania, the dog duty ascetic? Will it affect our rebirth? The dog duty ascetic, there was this belief that if you're really ascetic in the time of Buddhism, then you get enlightened. So this one guy, Sania, he was acting like a dog. He went around on all fours. And he never spoke, he barked. And he hung out with the dogs. He ate dog food, not human food. And when people, and he asked the Buddha, this is very tough to do, a lot of renunciation. What's going to happen to me in my next life? And the Buddha said, please don't ask me. Because even I know the answer to that. You get reborn as a dog. So, by being attached to your pets does not get you, actually it can do, get reborn as a dog. And I say that because experience, there was this Australian man, he had a lovely dog, and he said that in his next life, he wants to be reborn as a dog. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and then I told him, I said, why? Think. If you're a dog, you don't have to go to work. <laughs> you don't have to go to school. You know, you get fed, you get a nice cushion to sleep on. You have a nice easy life. No stress. All you need to do is you know, be taken for a walk in the morning and maybe you eat the best of food and you allow people to pet you. That's all you need to do. Pretty nice life. I think I told you the punchline of this. When I told him that all dogs in Australia have to go to the vet to get de-sexed. You remember him pausing and said, no, I think that might be a bad idea. I don't want to become a dog. <laughs> He's Australian. Okay, Ajahn Brahm, I experience seeing white round orbs and also orbs with electrifying beautiful colors floating in the air and was fully awake. They were beautiful. 
At times I could see white halo around the head and shoulder of a person. All these experiences are when I hardly meditate them. Nowadays when I start to meditate, I frequently, frequently see purple light. Ajahn Brahm, grateful for your guidance and explanation of my experiences so that I can move forward in my meditation practice. I think those orbs which you see are just dismissing, they can be all sorts of things. And nimittas are seen in the mind's eye, not with the eye. They are not a visual experience, they are a mental experience. That's why they're incredibly beautiful. So if you see purple light, wonderful. See if that purple light can be stable. So stable that it becomes even brighter. And it becomes an imiter. The orbs aren't limiters. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Can you elucidate, elucidate the connection between nimitta and jhana? Additionally, would you mind sharing your personal experience with the jhana state of consciousness? Is it true that one enters into jhana only if one's nimitta is always the same and unchanging? First of all, I think I've already mentioned to you, I cannot go into great detail of what a jhana feels like. However, I do know this monk very well, who's had experience of jhanas, and this monk tells me that once you have a nimitta, and it's very bright and very stable, it doesn't move, it gets brighter and deeper, then what happens is you feel yourself almost like falling into this nimitta's beautiful light, or the nimitta embracing you all, but not bodily, but just mentally. And so the nimitta is one of the first signs of the mind, just the mind and not the five senses, and then those five senses disappear and the mind joy takes over. And so the nimitta is like the doors into jhanas. They give you something to actually to settle, stabilize, brighten up, and when it does, it becomes a jhana. Is it true that one only enters into a jhana only if one's nimitta is always the same and unchanging? It's not as simplistic as that. This is, makes the jhana more likely if it's uh, stable and incredibly bright. That's what this monk told me. <laughs> it's frustrating sometimes, I've got to keep the Vinaya. Good evening Ajahn Brahm, can you say a little more and send merits to my friend Chi Chin Yu 66 years old, who is suffering from liver failure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I do that at the end when we do some chanting? Merits actually work. I've seen it work. And when you send it to some people, they can feel that someone's thinking about them. And that can sometimes just push them into a peaceful, either a peaceful death or even recovery. How's it going? It's 10 o'clock now. I do have a few questions left, but Venerable Shifu has many questions left. <laughs> 10 o'clock, it's a bit late, isn't it? Shall we keep going? Just for, these are the ones left. The reason I do this is because, honestly, I respect questions. I think it's not nice when you've taking the time and interest to write a question that could be important to you and it's not even answered. Dear Ajahn Brahm, questions. Do you consider countries that still practice the death penalty as barbaric and uncivilized? I wouldn't go as far as to say barbaric and uncivilized because that just is too critical. But I still think there's so many other ways to deal with very serious uh, punishments and death penalty doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, okay, this is important. When I was in San Francisco some time ago, there was a young man who was done many murders. He was the head of the Crips street gang. He was caught, he was um, judged. There was no doubt he had been responsible for many deaths. 
And so he was sentenced to, I think it was the um, lethal injection. But then, while he was waiting for all the appeals and the death sentence to be carried out, he was trying to do something good with his life. And so he managed to be a counselor to many other street kids in San Francisco. And because he knew exactly what it was like, he was a leader of a gang, he could communicate with these kids, he was really effective. So many people who could also have faced this death penalty were now uh, giving up their bad life and doing something good with their life. He was being so effective as a counselor and a helper that a lot of people got a, a petition together. Can you please give him some clemency? Okay, don't release him from jail, but let him carry on his amazing, priceless work as a counselor. So they tried to stop his death penalty. Unfortunately, because I was there at the time, just passing through, the governor of California at the time was a gentleman called Arnold Schwarzenegger. Terminator. <laughs> and his response, he may be a great actor, but this really disgusted me. He said, no, we don't sort of commute his death sentence. That would be a girly thing to do. Oh. And so he was executed. And look, I mean, he would have done so much good with his life. Anyway, what are the realistic possibilities of time travel based on your insights as a physicist and a Buddhist? Is there any relationship between past life recall and time travel? A little bit, because when you go into a past life, it's like you are there. I just mentioned just the early life, like being in my baby's pram. It was weird because I was in there. It was like remembering a time, you know, when you could choose to feel this, to see that, to smell that. And, you know, it wasn't like you were remembering a sequence of things which happened. You were right back in it. You couldn't change very much, but at least you could experience, like, being back in time but you can't do anything. You can't change things. There's time travel when you get a clear memory of what happened. So actual time travel, of course you can travel into the future, I mean that's well known in science. You go fast enough, you can go to Alpha Centauri, which how many light years away is that? I forget, I used to know, say six light years away. You can't travel fast in the speed of light, but it's six light years away. You can get there in six minutes. And the technological problems of, of being accelerated so fast without being squashed, that's a difficulty. But still, you can get to six years away, six light years away in six minutes. You can come back in another six minutes, but over 12 years have passed by. So when you come back, you haven't aged at all, but everyone else has got really old. So if you think I haven't aged since the last time I came to Penang, <laughs> now you know what I've been doing. <laughs> but that's not, no, it is like forward in time, you can't go back again, it's one way. Oh my goodness. Is a working knowledge of the original principal languages of Buddhist teaching texts, in Pali, Sanskrit, Thai Burmese, a prerequisite for the successful completion of a Buddhist monkhood education training. No. What was the principal language used on by your mentors and teachers during your novice monkhood education? It was like Thai, Northeast Thai. So I had to learn that. I love learning Pali. But it's not a prerequisite. The most important thing to learn is how to be peaceful, how to be kind. That is the language of the heart. What is the Buddhist view of incestuous relationship and how can this be prevented? 
first of all to make sure that everybody knows that is illegal, very harmful, Buddhist ways that is just very bad karma. You ruin a person's life when you have incestuous behavior. So you, know, you try and stop that. As a Buddhist monk, I have to legally carry around a, what's it called, like a child protection card. In other words, you, know, you have to send in your details to the government and they make sure that you have no record at all, no suspicion of ever having a sexual relationship with an underage kid. They did that because in Catholicism especially, there was many priests having illicit relations with children which they taught in schools. And that ruined so many lives. So even though that I don't know of any Buddhists who have had any such relations with underage boys or girls, still we have to have a child protection card with you at all times. I got mine in my bag over in uh, your apartment. Okay. Oh, that's that. That's Kaisi's questions. Oh no. What? Oh no, it's Ajahn. Yesterday, Venerable Kaisi talked about our attachments and last thoughts can hinder a person from being reborn to higher realms. Will a dying person be hindered if he loves his family too much and has thoughts of staying? If so, how can stop this? Yes, you are hindered if you love your family too much. And the way to overcome that is please the family. If you know, someone in your family is dying, they're very close to death, around their bedside, please tell them that you give them permission to die. It's okay to die. So, in other words, to say, our whole family, the people who really love you, we just want you to be free of this sickness, free of this pain and discomfort. And doctors tell us that's probably the only way that's going to work. So if you need to die, please go with our best wishes. Just like you send somebody off at the airport. I'm not saying when I'm going to the airport. <laughs> You say, go with our blessing. And then you don't feel sort of guilty of hurting people you care for too. Okay, the last question. Hey. Okay, it's ten past ten. I do apologize, but... Ajahn had mentioned that our attachment due to the presence of self. How do we overcome the self and attain Nibbana? You don't overcome the self. You just look inside and realize that which you thought was a self was not a self at all. A simile of the driverless bus. I haven't said that simile yet. That it's like, you know, you're living your life and sometimes your will doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You know, you say, don't be tired. You say to yourself, you know, just wake up, watch your breath. Does it always do what it's told? Does it always say, speak nicely to your partner in life? And you end up criticizing them. Be kind to the people who work for you in the office and you end up having politics. Why is it that life doesn't go as it should do? And the reason is because you, know, you don't know what this will is which controls the direction of your life. Just like you're in a bus and you're sitting down in the bus, you look out the window and you see some really terrible scenery. Toxic nuclear waste dumps. And you tell the driver, speed up, get out of here as soon as you can, this is terrible. What does your bus driver do? Slow down some parks. And other times you're going through this beautiful scenery, mountains and rivers and waterfalls. It's absolutely gorgeous. And what do you tell your bus driver? Stop. And the bus driver puts his feet down on the accelerator and speeds out. Why is it the good times of your life don't last as long as they should do? And the bad times, having COVID, having arguments, difficulty in the economy, why do they last so long? 
and you decide because you've got a stupid bus driver. <laughs> Doesn't know how to drive a bus. So eventually you realize you can solve the problem by finding that bus driver and tell him how to make choices in your life, good choices, not stupid choices. And eventually in meditation you find the bus driver's seat. And when you find the bus driver's seat, you have one of the most amazing insights of your life. You find the bus driver's seat is empty. There's no one there. Your bus is going according to almost like the driverless buses of Google, driverless cars, programmed, conditioned, cause and effect, run by dependent origination. What happens afterwards? Then you go back to your seat and you stop complaining. All the wanting, the desire and the ill will disappears. It's a waste of time shouting. I should do this, I should not do this. That all finishes. That's called a simile of the driverless bus. And when you understand that simile, you understand why right now I have to finish. <laughs> you can complain and shout as much as you like, but I'm not carrying on. Thank you. Do. Excellent.